Welcome to lecture 7.1, Harmonic Functions and Laplace's Equation. I'm going to motivate this with a quick crash course on higher dimensional PDEs, notably the heat and the wave equation in n dimensions. Now we've seen the del operator a few times, but it, it's going to come up a lot in this lecture. So let me just make sure that we're all on the same page. So del is a vector, a length n vector of partial derivatives. It's a linear operator or it's a vector of linear operators. And then the Laplacian operator is just del dot del. Sometimes this is written as del squared. I think in this lecture, I'm gonna stick with this triangle. And if you take the dot product of this with itself, you get a differential operator, which is just the sum of the second partial derivatives. In Rn, the heat equation, as we've seen, is ut equals c squared Laplacian u. And the wave equation is utt equals c squared Laplacian of u. Now several comments. First of all, in one dimension, these reduce down to ut equals c squared uxx and utt equals c squared uxx. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that this u is always a function of x1 up to xn and time t. But whenever we write the Laplacian of u, we're not including the t in the sum of the second derivative. So this is the sum of the second spatial derivative. So that's d squared dx1 plus d squared dxn. And I need squares on both of those. It is important to note that steady state solutions occur for the heat equation. Physically, that's because heat dissipates. And they do not occur for the wave equation because waves propagate. Now, it's important to understand why this is true both physically and mathematically, and we've seen both of the reasons. So let me summarize this. So suppose we have this bar of length L, and the initial temperature is something like like this. And the left and the right endpoints, as we've seen, suppose 32 degrees and 42 degrees. Now what's going to happen over time? Well, this is going to flatten out. So after a few minutes, it'll look like that. And then eventually it will approach the steady state solution, which is a this uh, just a linear solution from, in this case, 32 in one end to 42 in the other end. So the heat dissipates. Mathematically, that's because the solution is something like sine of n pi x over L times e to the minus c squared n squared pi squared x over L squared. And the exponential function is going to, is going to go to zero. So that's the physical reason. That's the mathematical reason. The wave equation, suppose we have a string of length L. And suppose it's vibrating and we have an initial wave that looks like this, then it just makes sense that this wave is going to vibrate forever, assuming that we don't have any damping or friction or energy loss. And mathematically, that's because the general solution is of the form sine of n pi x over L times um, maybe a n cosine of c n pi x over L plus bn sine of cn pi x over l. So now, instead of an exponential function that kills the wave, we have this sinusoid, which is going to go on forever and is going to oscillate, and that's why the wave propagates. Recall that a steady state solution, by definition, means that the time derivative of u is zero. In other words, the function is no longer changing with respect to time. Therefore, all steady state solutions of the heat equation up here satisfy the following. So if ut equals c squared Laplacian of u, then a steady state solution is what happens when we set that equal to zero. Now, if we do that, we can divide through by c squared. And the only thing that's really important is that the Laplacian of u equals zero. So to find a steady state solution in n dimensions, all we have to do is find all functions whose Laplacian is zero. 
In other words, solve this PDE in n variables. These functions have a special name. A function u is said to be harmonic if it's Laplacian is equal to zero. And the equation Laplacian of u equals zero, this is a PDE that is called Laplace's equation. In the remainder of this lecture, we will understand what solutions to Laplace's equation look like. We'll understand what it means for a function to be harmonic. And we'll do that mostly using our physical intuition of the heat equation and how heat dissipates. And then we will see how to solve Laplace's equation given different boundary conditions. Notice there's no such thing as an initial condition because these are functions of space, not of time. Let's try to understand two key properties of harmonic functions. I'll give them to you both and then we'll delve into them. First of all, the graphs of harmonic functions are as flat as possible. Next, if f is harmonic, then for any closed bounded region r, the function f achieves its minimum and maximum values on the boundary, which we're going to call del r. Here's how I like to think about this. This is my favorite way. Imagine that you go into your closet and you pull out a metal coat hanger. I don't know if those are even still around or any sort of piece of metal. And you bend it into a weird closed shape like this. And then you stick that into a bucket of soap. What's going to happen when you pull it out? Well, you're going to get this solution that's pretty flat. It's going to be basically as flat as possible. So I don't know how good I am at drawing this, but you can think of it like a potato chip, maybe, if you want. So I'm going to call this a soap bubble. This is how I want you to think of a harmonic function, at least a two-variable harmonic function, is a, a soap bubble surface. Now let's, let's take a moment to look at the 1D heat equation. So in, because we're familiar with that, I'm going to compare so I'm going to do this in one lower dimension, but I'm going to do this via the 1D heat equation. Okay, so suppose that U of xt is the temperature of, of a bar. And so let's give it boundary conditions. U of 0t equals A, and U of L at t equals B. So here's our bar. So this is x equals 0, and this is x equals L. And suppose that the temperature at the left end point is A, and the right end point is B. Now, I don't care what the initial temperature is, how wild or crazy it is. It doesn't even have to be continuous. What's going to happen over time? This will flatten out, and it will approach this straight line steady state solution. So this is USS of x. This is going to be some line. I've used A and B, so let me call it Cx plus d. Okay, so the heat equation, I guess I didn't write it down, but that's, this is ut equals c squared uxx. So a steady state solution is when this is equal to zero. It's when the time derivative is zero. And so the steady state solution is when u, the second derivative with respect to x is zero. And that's precisely what these straight lines are, cx plus d. These are linear straight line solutions and their second derivative is zero. So here the math matches up with our physical intuition. Now let's keep going with this physical intuition. Let's do this soap bubble thing in one fewer dimension down here. Now for soap bubble, let me, instead of calling this a soap bubble, let me say that this is made of metal and you're stretching plastic wrap around it. So it's like you're, you're making a drum type surface or a potato chip. How does that work in one fewer dimension? So here the boundary is this, is this closed curve. In, and this is a region, we call this, this region R. Now in one dimension, our region R is, is a bar. And the boundary of a bar is just two points. So what happens if you stretch a rubber band around two points, so this point and that point, you're going to get a straight line. This is the surface, that the one-dimensional surface that is as flat as possible. This is a harmonic function. So in 1D, 
Harmonic functions are those that are as flat as possible, these rubber band surfaces. In 2D, harmonic functions are those that are as flat as possible, these potato chip or soap bubble solutions. Okay, now let's take this one-dimensional heat equation. Let's go up a dimension. Let's look at the two-dimensional heat equation. So now we have a, a, uh, a like a metal plate. Let's suppose this is the x direction and this is the y direction. And as, as we did in the 1D case, let's fix the temperature of the boundary of this region. So let's suppose the temperature of the right end point is fixed at zero. The left end point, suppose it dips down a little bit and it's a little bit negative. Suppose at this, at this left end point, it's something like that. And suppose this at this left end point, the left side, the back edge, suppose it's, it's something like, like that. So now imagine, well, before, so we, so we have the temperature of the square region. Let me actually write that out. U of X, Y, T is the temperature at position X and Y and time T. The heat equation here is UT equals C squared Laplacian of U. And just like what we did here, we're fixing the temperature at the boundary, we are fixing the temperature for all time T at this boundary like this. So imagine that this is, is a metal uh, wire uh, carved in the, or bent in the shape of this boundary right here. And then take that metal wire and dip that into a bucket of soap. Now here's where I'm gonna be challenged with trying to draw this. Um, so that surface is gonna look like, I don't know if this is good, but you can at least do your imagination. So here's what that soap bubble surface, in this case, is going to look like. It's going to be as flat as possible. So now with the heat equation, I don't care what my initial temperature is. Suppose my initial temperature is like this, something crazy. Well, as time goes to infinity, heat dissipates. This is going to flatten out, and it will approach in the limit the steady state solution, which is this soap bubble solution. Now, I don't know if it's exactly the soap bubble solution because there's other gravitational and small physical details, but if it's not, it's really darn close to it. So the steady state solution, so this, so U S S is now a function of X and Y, and that's what happens when the Laplacian, when the time derivative is equal to zero. So the Laplacian of U equals zero, that's the same thing as a steady state solution. That's the same thing as this soap bubble solution. So I want you to connect the mathematical meaning of setting the time derivative equal to zero and getting Laplace's equation with the physical meaning of fixing the temperature along the boundary, whether you're in two dimensions or one dimension or higher dimensions. We can't visualize that because we can't visualize three dimensional surfaces in four dimensional space. But these, these things are all the same thing. These are harmonic functions and their graphs are as flat as possible. So let's summarize that. So har right down here, I'm gonna say harmonic functions. By definition, these the, satisfy Laplacian of U equals zero. These are in the kernel of the Laplace operator. And algebraically, we know this is the same thing as steady state solutions to the heat equation. So we know these are the same, and we know that by just setting ut to be equal to zero. So we start with the heat equation and we set ut equal to zero, we get, it's by definition a steady state solution to the heat equation. And finally, we know just using, not algebra this time, but using our physical intuition, that this is the same thing as, I'm gonna call these flat functions. So soap, 
soap bubbles, uh, plastic wrap, etc. You can think of it as a potato chip or 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 a surface of a drum, etc. So using our physical intuition, steady state solutions to the heat equation, these surfaces are functions that are as flat as possible. And using algebra, this is the same thing as harmonic functions. So now by transitivity, we know all of these things are the same. We have several different diverse characterizations of harmonic functions. Finally, let me say a few words about this. So all of that was this first property. The second property, if f is harmonic, then for any closed bounded region r, the function f achieves its minimum and maximum values on the boundary. So what does that mean? Well, that means that these soap bubble surfaces, like this guy here or that, they can't have any local minimums. So suppose you did. Suppose you, you were to cut out a little piece of this. And, um, then, oops, let me draw that up here. Then, then there's, well, there's no way there's ever going to be a local minimum or a maximum on the surface. And that's the same thing as saying that the minimum or maximum occurs on the boundary. Let's go back to the soap bubble. Suppose you, you hold this thing. Think of it like a potato chip now. You hold this thing and you twist it, you turn it. No matter how you do it, the, the highest point in the air is going to be on the wire. And the lowest point, the closest to the ground, is going to be on the boundary as well. There's no local minimums or maximums in here. And similarly, you can imagine that, it, that if you do that, this surface, no matter, you, you take this piece and you, you hold it up and you twist it around, the, the hottest point or the highest point is gonna be on the boundary as is the lowest point. Equivalently, the hottest point of this surface is gonna be up here on the boundary and the coldest point is gonna be down here on the boundary. That is another equivalent characterization of harmonic functions. It's harder, to, as I said, it's harder to visualize this in higher dimensions, but mathematically, the same thing carries through. Let's do some examples of harmonic functions. In one variable, they're pretty easy. They're just straight lines. So f of x is ax plus b, and that's because these are the functions whose second derivative equals zero. And two variables. Well, one simple example are planes, f of xy equals ax plus by plus c, because here f xx plus f y y, so this is the Laplacian of f, well, both second derivatives are zero, so we get zero plus zero equals zero. Okay, these are both trivially harmonic. They're as flat as possible. Planes and lines are flat. So what else is there? Well, here's another example. f of x, y equals x squared minus y squared. So this is a saddle. Let's see if I can sketch it up here. So it looks something like, like this. And never easy to sketch these these things but I think you get better with practice okay so I claim that this is har harmonic now notice that well let's do it algebraically first so f x x plus plus f y y so the the second x partial of this is 2 and the second y partial is negative 2 so this is 2 minus two equals zero. So algebraically, this is harmonic. Graphically, well, if I've drawn it right, then the, then the highest point on this surface, uh, let's just say that the maximum uh, is maybe up here and the minimum is down here, both of these lie on the boundary. And moreover, this holds for any region in the plane. So this surface is, is infinite. I just have drawn a little piece of it. So let's take another region. Let's take a knife or maybe a cookie cutter and let's cut a region from here take a knife and cut a little piece from it and however you do that I claim whatever that resulting surface is the maximum and minimum point so maybe the maximum is is up here and the minimum is there will still be on the boundary that's that characteristic property fundamental property of harmonic functions 
Okay, so let me give you a definition that I actually, I don't think I have, I mentioned it earlier, but I don't think I've typed it up in the lecture, and it's important. So the, the PDE, which is Laplacian of U equals zero, is called Laplace's equation. And it's a couple words. First of all, I stopped using del squared for Laplace. Laplacian, and because this is the Laplacian in Cartesian coordinates. But when we move in, into polar coordinates, the Laplacian is not going to be quite so simple. It's the sum of the second derivatives we have. And the best way to explain that is, um, remember back in when you're studying vector calculus, how in dA was, was dx dy. And when you went in polar, dA was then you had to do dr d theta, but you had to stick an r in there. And it was more complicated when you got into spherical and cylindrical. Similar thing. The Laplacian is, is del squared, but only in Cartesian coordinates, for the same reason why dA is dx times dy, only in Cartesian coordinates. So that's, that's I think, why most people switch to this triangle uh, Laplacian of you. And finally, so let me say a word about why we care so much about this besides just steady state solutions to the heat equation. Well, I guess it, it's really all boils down to that. But the, the heat equation, remember, is ut equals Laplacian of u. And th this is in any number of dimensions. So in, in zero dimensions, what was the zero dimensional heat equation? Oops, let me make that a little better, heat equation. So I claim we've actually seen the zero dimensional heat equation. That was Newton's law of cooling. It really was. I mean, that described the heat of a temperature of a cup of coffee, which we could really think of as a point mass. So this doesn't have a whole, a, a whole bar's worth of, of, of temperature, but now it's just a point. And that was T prime equals, that ODE was T prime equals negative K, T minus 72. And like any ODE that was linear and non-homogeneous, the solution y or t of little t was the homogeneous solution plus any particular solution. Let me call it the steady state solution, which was equal to 72. Now, in the that's the zero-dimensional heat equation. In the one-dimensional heat equation. We had ut equals c squared uxx. And if we had inhomogeneous boundary conditions, then the general solution was u of xt equals the steady state solution plus what I called the homogeneous solution, the solution when the boundary conditions were homogeneous. So you see a pattern here, steady state plus homogeneous. So this holds in higher dimensions as well. The general solution u of x1 up to xn and t is going to be the steady state solution us of x1 up to xn plus the homogeneous so solution, the solution to the related problem where the boundary conditions are homogeneous. So just to solve the heat equation in n dimensions, assuming that the for inhomogeneous boundary conditions, we absolutely have to solve, find the steady state solution, meaning we have to solve Laplace's equation first. So that's one reason why it is so important to solve this equation. And that's, that's what we're going to spend the rest of this lecture doing. Now that we understand the importance of Laplace's equation, let's solve it. So here is a boundary value problem for Laplace's equation. Here's the PDE uxx plus uyy equals zero. And we have three boundary conditions that are zero and one non-zero boundary condition. So this represents the steady state temperature, you can think of it that way, on a square region. And these three, well, let's, let's do this. Let's say that the x is in this direction, y is in that direction. So this is the point zero, zero. And this is back here is the point 
pi pi. So instead of using length L like I usually do, I'm gonna use length pi because it's just easier to write sine of nx instead of sine of n pi x over L. It's not like this isn't messy enough already. So these, this first boundary condition says that the temperature when x equals zero is equal to zero for all time t. So that's this boundary here. The temperature is fixed at zero. This next boundary condition says that, that when y equals zero, the temperature is zero. So y equals zero along here. And finally, the temperature, or this third boundary condition says that the temperature is zero when x equals pi. So that's along here. And this last boundary condition says that along the back edge, when y equals pi, that's over here, the temperature is this parabola, the familiar one that we've seen a number of times before. So this blue curve represents the, think of this as the wire that we're dipping down into the soap bubble. So th the solution that is as flat as possible, this soap bubble solution, or the steady state solution to the heat equation, is going to look like that. Okay, let's solve this. So I'm going to... We're going to do separation of variables like we always do. Nothing different. So I'm going to, I'm not going to go through every gory detail because I, um, a lot of the stuff we've done before. So we will assume that the solution u of x, y, that there is a solution of the form, I'm going to call it capital X of x times capital Y of y. So instead of f and g, I'm going to use big X and big y. And then we're going to plug back in. So before we do that, we need to take derivatives. And this is where I'm going to go quickly. So uxx equals x double prime y. Uyy equals xy double prime. And now, we'll, now we want to use our, our zero boundary conditions, as I like to call them. So this first one says that u of zero y, which is x of 0, y of little y equals 0. And from that, we conclude that this is a number times y of y. That's a function in the y direction, which is clearly not constant. The product of a number times a function is 0. That number better be equal to 0. So we get that x of 0 equals 0. And similarly, we get from this condition we get that y of zero equals zero. And from this third condition, we get that x of pi equals zero as well. So x of pi equals zero. I don't know if I didn't draw that very well, did I? I don't think I'm gonna, well, I'm just gonna say u, I'll do this. u of x zero equals dot, 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 and u pi of y equals dot, 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 and we get, we get these three conditions. Okay, so let's, let's plug back in now. So let's plug, plug back in. So if we plug back in, um, I'm going to write this as, well, let's say uxx plus uyy equals zero. How about if I write that as, as x double prime y equals negative xy double prime? That's clearly the same as this. Now let's divide through by, normally I say c squared f g, but there's no c, so let's divide by x y. Here in x y here, what's gonna happen? The y's cancel here, the x's cancel here, and we get that x double prime over x equals negative y double prime over y. And well, this quantity does not depend on the y direction. And this, that's equal to this quantity, which does not depend on x. So whatever it is, it has to be a constant. So I'm going to call it negative lambda. Now, I, you might wonder, why did I put the negative sign here? Well, I didn't have to. I could have put the negative sign here. I didn't have to put the negative sign in front of lambda. And it, it all doesn't matter. You're going to be, but um, as long as you're consistent, but it's just, it's going to be easier if we want, if we make the, the function in x look most like what we've had before with sines and cosines. Because if you look at this, the function in the x, 
The boundary conditions in, in X are what we normally see for the heat equation. They're both zero. So in the X direction, things look similar to the heat equation with Dirichlet conditions. So let's keep things the same and, and, and do that. So in Y, things are a little bit different. So I'll come back to this momentarily. So now let's write down our, our ODE. So we have X double prime equals negative lambda x, and we have these two boundary conditions up here. So we have x of 0 equals x of pi equals 0. And now we have y double prime equals, be careful, y double prime equals positive, positive lambda y. Okay, so we know how to solve this first equation. This first equation is that x of little x, actually before I, I do that, let me just say what lambda is. Lambda n is n squared, and x of little x is, so xn of x is sine of nx. Isn't it easier when we use, when let l equal pi? No sine pi x over l, because they cancel. Okay, so now I'm gonna update this, so y double prime equals negative n, is it, oh, I have to be careful, oops, no, it's positive n squared, positive n squared y. And we actually have, I didn't write it, but we have one boundary condition here. So, and we have y of zero equals zero. Okay, so if we solve this, now, remember what I said when we studied boundary value problems. So you look at this, y double prime equals n squared y, you think exponentials, right? I mean, we do know that y of x, or y of little y is c1 e to the n y plus c2 e to the negative n y. But remember, for boundary value problems, I strongly recommend you use cinches and cautious. So y n of y equals, I'm going to say, a cosh of n y plus b cinch of n y. If you're rusty on that, go back to the lecture on boundary value problems where we went over cinches and coshes. So this is better than, than that. We don't want to use that. Okay, now what have we not used? We have not used y of zero equals zero. So let's let's do that. So y n of zero, we plug in zero. Cinch and cosh behave just like sines and cosines. So we get a times one plus b times zero. So a equals zero. And so what we get is y n. So a is zero. So this term goes away. And we are left with y n of y equals, I'm going to say b n. Actually, I don't need a, uh, yeah, I don't need that constant there. I only had it there because I, I have two of these things. But so y n of y is cinch of n y. The constant will come back later. Don't worry about it. It's, it's not going anywhere. So that that's what lambda is. That's what x is. And this is what y is. So now let me say a few words about what I, I said previously, I could have put this negative sign over there. And if I had done that, it just would have made things harder. I encourage you to try it if you want, but because of this, you look at these equations, this first one looks like what we've had before in boundary in, for boundary value problems, for like the heat equation and a wave equation. Don't make things harder, just, um, it's much more natural to do this. I mean, if you had done this with a positive here, you would have had cinches, but then you would have had I's in there and, and you would have spatially gotten sines and cosines. So make things easier, put the negative sign there. Okay, so now what we have is, is for each N. So for each N equals, I claim we don't need to start at, at zero because if N equals zero, X is zero. So for each integer N, we have a solution U N of x and y, which is sine of nx cinch of ny. 
So we have a solution like this. So our general solution, so the general solution is u of x, y, the infinite sum from n equals 1 to infinity of u n of x, y. Oh, and I should put a coefficient in front of here, b n. Sorry about that. So I'll make, I'll make this bigger, I promise. n equals 1 to infinity of b n sine of n x cinch of n y. So by superposition, by linearity, we can add any combination of these functions that we want to, and this is the general solution. So now let's see what we've done. So we've, what we've done is we've solved Laplace's equation subject to these three boundary conditions being zero. And we haven't said anything about this last condition. So depending on how we fix this last condition, that's going to tell us what the BNs are. So given that we chose this particular function for this last boundary condition, that should tell us what BN is. So let's, let's do that. So now let's use last, the fourth boundary condition. So let's plug in zero for y, now pi for y, u of x pi. Yeah, so we're plugging in that guy. I'm so used to plugging in zero last, but not this time. The u of x pi equals the infinite sum from n equals one to infinity of bn. Now I'm gonna actually put the, the cinch first because when I plug pi in for here, that's gonna be, a, cinch of n pi is gonna be a number, okay? So I want to stick that number in front of the bn. So bn cinch of n pi, that number, times sine of n x. And we have to set that equal to this function, which is x times pi minus x. And we know what the Fourier series, so, so we have to write this as a Fourier sine series. And we've done that a number of times. So this is n equals one to infinity of four times one minus negative one to the n over, I think, is, is it pi n squared? No, it's pi, it's pi n cubed times sine of n x. So now we can't, can't actually say this is bn. It's not quite. Here's what we have. We have bn cinch of n pi equals that thing, four times one minus negative one to the n over pi n cubed. So what this tells us is that bn, bn is this thing divided by cinch of n pi. That cinch of n pi is just a number. Remember that cinch of, and it's not zero because cinch looks sort of like that. So bn is four times one minus negative one to the n over pi n cubed cinch of n pi. So our, our final solution, our particular solution that solves this entire boundary value problem is the following. So it's u of x, y, let's see if I have room here. So sum from n equals one to infinity of bn, so that's four times one minus negative one to the n divided by pi n cubed cinch of n pi, that's my coefficient, times, times what? Times sine of nx cinch of n y. So times sine of nx times cinch of n y. So this crazy looking function is the harmonic function whose boundary is given by these four little pieces right here. It is the steady state solution to the heat equation. We will use this function in a later lecture. I will give you the heat equation with these particular boundary conditions. So remember this, this will come up later as the steady state solution to a PDE. Our second example is almost the same as the boundary value problem in the previous example. In fact, if you reverse the roles of x and y, it is the same. 
That means that this describes Laplace's equation in a square region where only the rightmost boundary condition is non-zero. And the corresponding surface is or solution is exactly what we got in the previous example, just rotated 90 degrees. So by symmetry, we know that the solution is going to be the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 4 times 1 minus negative 1 to the n over pi n cubed cinch of n pi times cinch of n x times sine of n y. So we've just reversed which one of these is cinch and which one of them is sine. Finally, example 1c is a superposition of the boundary value problems from examples 1a and 1b. So if we add up the boundary conditions from those two examples, we still get 0 at the left and the front, but now we got these parabolas at the back and the right. So in other words, what this looks like is the following region. So we have a square region, x in this direction, y in that direction. And now we have the boundary conditions are non-zero at the back and at the right. So if I were to, I don't know how to draw this soap bubble solution very, very well, but if I try to draw it, but the steady state solution to the heat equation and the soap bubble solution is going to look, look like this. And I bet you already know how to solve this. So if I take the example from, if I take the solution from example 1a, so this is, I'm going to call this 1a, and I add it to the solution. Think of these as surfaces. Solution from 1b. Not surprisingly, I get this solution. So this superposition of those, which is 1c. In other words, the solution to this boundary value problem by linearity or by superposition is the infinite sum from 1 to infinity of, well, let's pull out that constant 4 times 1 minus negative 1 to the n over pi n cubed cinch of n pi and then let's write the first one was sine of nx cinch of ny. And then the next one was plus cinch of nx times sine of ny. So again, the solution to part A, 1A was this times that. And to part 1B, it was this times that and we add them together, we get the solution to part 1c. Okay, so of course, we can extend this. If we wanted to, we could, you know, in theory, we could come up with a, a region that had all four boundaries have non-zero boundary conditions. So we could have something like this, and we could have something like that, and this, and that. And we could do this piece by piece if we wanted to. It would be long and tedious, but we can solve Laplace's equation on a bounded square domain piece by piece in this manner. Our last example is a boundary value problem for Laplace's equation on an unbounded domain, and for that we will need a Fourier transform. So here x is allowed to be any real number, and y has to be positive, so the boundary is going to be when y equals zero. Moreover, we require our solution to be bounded as y goes to infinity. That's by choice. We'll have two choices, as we'll see, and this is the one that we want to understand because it's more natural with modeling. So let me sketch what this looks like. So I'm going to sketch this more. The, the axes aren't going to quite match up how I've oriented them early in this lecture, but it, this is how you probably saw them in vector calculus. Okay, so the boundary condition, let's suppose it looks something like, like this. It doesn't have to look like that, but it's easier to draw that way. And y being positive is this half of the plane. So if, if this were like a, a heater, and we're looking at a heat equation, and this is the only source of heat, then this is going to die off and look, look like that. So th this is that sort of the steady state heat 
doesn't really work with a soap bubble as, as much now that it's infinite. Um, so this is the steady state to the heat equation. Now, why did I say bounded? Because if you actually extend this thing to the whole real line, this is in the y direction, this turns out to be like a cinch function as we saw. Well, cinch is unbounded. So extending this, this would be unbounded in that direction. So basically we aren't given any, we don't have any choice with this boundary one direction the function is going to go to zero the other direction is going to blow up and all we're saying here is we want the direction that goes to zero because that is more natural for the heat equation okay so let's let's solve this so the first thing to do is to well let's write the pde out here u y y equals zero so let's take the fourier transform so take the fourier transform um, with respect to the variable x. So y is going to be along for the ride. It's going to be a parameter or a constant. So if we do that, remember that the Fourier transform of ux is going to be i times omega times u hat, and the Fourier transform of uy is just uy hat. Okay, so if we apply the Fourier transform to both of these, we get, so I squared, I omega squared is negative omega squared. So we get negative omega squared U hat plus U YY hat equals zero. And this is an ODE. So this is an ODE in y. So how do we solve this? So this is exponential functions or cinches and coshes. Now I know I said with boundary value problems you should use cinches and coshes. I'm going to make this an, as an exception because we're dealing with Fourier transforms and exponentials are easier to invert, compute the inverse transform than cinches and coshes. So the the solution to this is is that u hat which, let me just remind you, is now a function of omega and y. This is c1, a little bit of space here, c1 e to the omega y plus c2, a little bit of space, e to the negative omega y. Why is there space? Well, because this is a constant in y, but it very well might depend on omega. Because then this is an ODE in, in y. So C1 is C1 of omega, and C2 is really C2 of omega. Okay, now we want that, now we require that y is bounded, or this u is bounded as y goes to infinity. So if, if y is, po uh, here, y is positive, that's the domain. So if omega is positive, then C1 has to be zero. Otherwise, this is going to blow up. So, so this function has to be, equal to zero if omega is positive. And similarly, C2 has to be equal to zero anytime omega is negative. Because if it's not, then for some y, this is gonna blow up and not be bounded. So this has to be equal to zero if omega is negative. So a better way to write this is that, um, oops, I didn't mean to write, u hat of omega y well, this is, there's, so what's the coefficient in front of here? It's some function of omega. Well, it's, it's really the fun, it's a function of absolute value of omega. So I'm going to write this as some function C of omega times E to the negative absolute value of omega times Y. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to write it like, like that. And do I want to? Yeah, I'll box that. Okay, so now what do we want to do? We don't know C. We don't know what this function is. How do we find this? How do we generally find a constant? We plug in the initial or boundary condition, and that's what we have here. So I'm going to plug in y equals 0, and if I do that, I get u hat of omega 0 equals C of omega times e to the zero, 
And well, this this guy up here, if I take the u hat of omega zero is f hat of omega. Just it, these are equal, and their Fourier transforms are equal. So we can set this this equal to f hat of omega, and now we know. Well, I guess I didn't need to write that. Now we know that c of omega, e, we know what c of omega is. It's c is equal to f hat. So now we know that our, our solution, u hat of our Fourier transform, we're trying to find the solution to this. And we haven't found it, but we found the Fourier transform. And that Fourier transform is precisely, I'm going to write it as e to the negative absolute value or e to the negative absolute value of omega times y times f hat of w. So this is, so we want to find, let's see, so the solution u, this is the Fourier transform of, of u. So all we need to do is invert this. So let me do this. So next we need to uh, compute or find the inverse Fourier transform of, of u hat of omega y. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, this is a product of two functions. So by the convolution theorem, the inverse Fourier transform is just the convolution of, of, of the inverse transforms of these two things. So we know the inverse transform of f hat, that's just f, that's, that's, that's f of x right here. The inverse transform of this, what is that? So that, I'm going to leave this as an exercise. I really don't want to do it right here, but probably as homework. The inverse Fourier transform of e to the negative a times absolute value omega is equal to a over pi times 1 over x squared plus a squared. Okay, so if you buy this, then u of x, y is just the convolution of that, where, where look, look at this, that y, a is equal to y, convolution of that with f, inverse Fourier transform of that. So this is equal to y over pi, times 1 over x squared plus y squared. Take that. Uh, I really should not have called this star right here. For I was trying to mark that equation, and I'm using that for convolution. I'm sorry about that. So this time, the uh, convolution of that with f, and that, by definition, is y over pi times negative infinity to infinity of f of tau d tau over x minus tau squared plus y squared. And that is our final solution. Okay, so what did you think of that? Well, I personally like the bounded domains better. I think it's a little simpler. But hey, this is it's pretty powerful that to solve this on an unbounded domain, you turn to the Fourier transform and it falls right out. Okay, so next time we are going to use Laplace's equation to solve the wave equation and the heat equation. Actually, it's just the heat equation because that's when we have the unbound, the inhomogeneous boundary conditions. And so I think with that, we're going to leave it there. So stay with us.